As part of the Get, already mentioned Getty Foundation, um, they're linking Australia and South Africa because we all um, basically have open air rock art sites. Much of the rock art sites in Europe and elsewhere are closed. But um, it's not just South Africa, we've had other Southern African countries and also this year we had a Kenyan representative, there's been Moroccan representatives and we had a Argentinian representative. And because some of the Australians work in places like Laos and, and, and China, um, what we are aiming, the aiming of this workshop is to actually uh, produce a Kakadu charter. We had some of the people who actually wrote the borough charter there with us. So we're hoping to do a best practice for management and rock art sites, but that's another talk for another time. Um, I just want to give a, f a glimpses of specifically the rock art management in uh, the um, two parks. Um, and for those of us involved in rock art management and in other forms of management, uh, to quote from the book where I got the title from A Tale of Two Cities, it was the best of time, it was the worst of time. We had everything, yet we had nothing. So I think that kind of describes the life of a manager, whether you're biodiversity, natural, environmental, or, or um, cultural, we have good times, <laughs> yet we have nothing. Um, quickly, most of you should know what rock art is, pictographs, paintings, drawings, stencils, and prints, or pictograph the engravings. This is a nice way to describing it. Rock art is about encountering the visual past fixed in place. There's our paintings from the Drakensberg. Ten points and a free whiskey if you can identify where it comes from. And no, Michelle, you <laughs> nobody from ACT is allowed to answer any questions here. Um, but that is Kakadu. Now, within Australia, there's also differences. As, uh, we'll get to the unique things about Kakadu. Quick overview of conserving rock art site. Uh, sites are continually subjected to accumulation and deterioration. Opposite force, uh, forces, but both destructive. A nice little tamaleki. Was rock art ever meant to last forever? New pressures are speeding up the processes of deterioration and destruction, and there are actions we can take down the processes by management and physical conservation. So yes, Melanie, we are approaching it from this point. <laughs> UDP, the largest concentration of rock art in Sub-Saharan Africa. No rock art tradition since the 1880s. Mountainous environment, and as I've already said, our communities are spatially, um, well, the art is temporarily and spatially removed from the authors, which is a very, very tricky thing in management because although uh, managers are criticized as being Western, what communities ask is African and we need to then also look at the Khoisan way of looking at rock art. Therefore, currently being used by other groups, e.g. Zulu healers, I'm talking about the spiritual values now, not the domestic values as uh, Melanie would refer to them. Um, at the present, uh, management is influenced by Kaiserin Wildlife and Amarfa. It's known for its shaded polychrome big paintings and focuses a lot of the Sima Eland. Three anthropes, those are um, of the few whiskies, not possible to say, but these are when people take on as aspects of animals when they go into trance and it contains some contact art. Kakadu, not Kruger. Kakadu um, contains one of the greatest concentration of rock art sites in the world. It has a continuous rock art, Gumjiminji, is what they call it, tradition. There is recorded rock art up until 1986. It's not in a mountainous area, although there are some pretty impressive rocks there. It's more escarpment than gorges and rock outliers where it is found. Because the communities that live there are descendant communities and users, there's tangible evidence of a close personal relationship between these Aboriginal people and their land and their rock art. Sites by archaeological excavation are proved to be of 50,000 years old. So we've got a nice span from 50,000 years up until fairly recent. 
It therefore constitutes one of the longest records of any group of people. It's older as the South African art and younger than the South African art. It is looked after by the local clans and the Kakadu National Park. We will get to it, but these are one of the clans and they have rangers. We'll get a little bit of the community ranger aspect on. It is believed to have been painted by spiritual people where rock art in South Africa are painted by people trying to access the spiritual world. They have got lovely little paintings, look at the thin long things called Mimi spirits and I just love them. Mm -hmm. that the fact that this mysterious Mimi spirit comes out and does certain type of the drawings. Um, the x-ray paintings and I'll explain it, it does look, there's lots of anatomical things, it looks like an x-ray. Other places, more towards central Australia, you've got the dots. But the Kakadu is known for the x-ray painting. And the, the themes are fish, crocodiles. It's because um, Kakadu also borders the sea and most of the clans have a seasonal movement where they access the sea and has a spiritual relationship with it too. Kangaroo, spirit people, people and modern items um, because the, there's a lovely painting of the Sydney Harbour Bridge and of the uh, local football team in Darwin's emblem. Um, paintings from the Berg, mythical water snakes, the shaded polychrome, um, Moving a little bit, because most of you are familiar with the birds, so I'm going to show a bit more pictures from Kakadu. Lovely footprints, foot stencils, not prints. It's a footprint and a foot stencil in this case. Um, there's a, it's, it's Arnhem Land, named after one of the first Dutch travellers into Australia, so you do see a lot of ships. You even see a lot of ships on stilts being fixed up. Um, and... What is so amazing to go there is, and I sadly don't have a picture of it, one of the pictures, a lot of paintings that the Aboriginal people in that area does is of the creator being. And mostly you see her with one little tiny pe person in her tummy and then there's suddenly um, one with two people, one sitting down and the other one standing like this and we said to one of the Aboriginal elders, what's it? Oh no, that's when we realised that she also made the white fella. So, <laughs> so then they just kind of, now there's two little people and so you can kind of date it on that. It's, but it's very matter of factly, there's, it, it seems like, okay, we thought we would just have original people, clearly Mother Earth made more people, so just incorporate it totally into the art, the fact that there's white fellas. Um, continuous spiritual connection after visiting the site, <laughs> this is also a nice difference. Uh, we are told when we, and as Melanie's paper said, when we access rock art sites, we might interfere with the spiritual importance. Here we had to get cleansed with a specific tree being burned by the Aborigines so that the bad spirits don't come into us. So a totally different way of looking at the spiritual importance. Here we're going to be bad spirits into rock art sites and um, need to burn them prayerful to get rid of it. Yeah, they're scared that bad spirits from the rock art site is going to come into us and we need to be clean. So that uh, clean. So this is quite a different way, especially if you're looking then at intangible management of rock art between the two places. Um, there is no ceremonial cleansing of a rock art site after people have been visited. You visit, a, you go there with an Aboriginal guide and they will, before you enter, shout and introduce each of you by name to the spiritual beings into the cave and that's about it, just to say hello. So um, that's the difference. Continual cultural tradition. Um, right there, you can't see it because it's in the shade now is two spears. Um, even up until today from that local clan, young man have to stand pretty much where I'm with the photo and if he can't throw a spear and it lodges into that corner then he's not a man. So apparently there's 40 year old men who still... <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm amazed that most men, I mean it is. It's so um, yeah, so these traditions are still taking place there. Threats to rock art. Now, I hope you can see the colour differentiation. The pinky, bricky colour is uh, UDP, 
and the green colour is um, kakadu. Both water and rain. Kakadu tends to have more damage by wind um, because a lot of the sites are close to tourist tracks and because the, the Kakadu Highway, no, the Arnhem Land Highway that goes into Arnhem Land, so there's a, there's a lot of concerns about trucks kicking up dust. Fire and smoke both, burning happens. Um, the burning in Kakadu is done by the community. Their, their traditional burning is incorporated into the felt management there. Flaking and cracking, I don't think that it happens, but it's not a, that major a concern. Structural collapse, um, I think we've, we've had to, in the Cathedral Peak area, lost out as one or two sites to entire collapse. Vegetation growth and rubbing, both parks. Algae mineralization, that seems to be a big problem in, in Kakadu, much more than it is here. Mineralization, insects and animals, also seems to be more of a Kakadu uh, one. Direct sunlight both and now cultural. Tourism, I think we have more of a problem with the impact of tourism in the bird than, than they have to not quickly discuss it. Rubbish, I've not seen rubbish at any of the rock art sites there and I'm not talking about bedding rubbish and food rubbish. Unwanted visitors to uh, the tourism site, non-tourism sites, I think the problem is more here. Graffiti, again, the problem is here. Theft, uh, very occasionally, of archaeological. Fe developmental, both are protected areas, so industrial um, threats, except unless they start fracking, but I know those people are not going to let it happen on that <laughs> side of the room. <laughs> um, and then conservation practices, they have a bit of a problem. They love putting brick, uh, drip lines on themselves, the rangers, who have uh, commercially bought uh, silicon from hardware stores and then introduced animals. So from this little one, you can clearly see that on the South African side of the view, we ca kind of physical conservation is good, but our tourism practices are bad. There they... Um, I know, uh, yeah, there they've got tourism under control, but they're still a bit outdated things, and I think that's one of the things that we are looking into the, the exchange between the two countries. There's some structural collapse in the berg, there's some flaking, splintering, and uh, pigment removing. Now, conservation, what is needed on both sides? To train staff in rock art <coughs> management, and I'm now talking about the conservation staff, the rangers, etc. Conservation management processes, it must be updated regularly. In both countries, we cannot, in both parks, we cannot rely on something that's been written 20 years ago. User-friendly guidelines. Your field rangers cannot be bogged down by huge academic terms when it comes to putting guidelines down. Um, and I think, Sonia, there we've kind of worked on the little monitoring cards and things <laughs> as an attempt. And yet again, what is sustainable, but we need to look at sustainable practices. The conservation of rock art sites, there's uh, ranges in the, in the Berg. The conservation itself includes the, monitor uh, the recording, monitoring and mitigation. Uh, the UDP's got uh, ACT, the ramp one and two, data management on SARS and other data management. Significance assessment has already been done at World Heritage Statements. We have closed and open sites in Kakadu. Australia has more rock art sites than any other country in the world, but no national register of recorded sites. There is no national central archaeological or rock art database, which you can already say, if you do not know me, my baseline data is, says that there is a problem. But what they do have is, in Kakadu itself, with external funding, is their iPad recording and monitoring. I will not comment on what will, I suspect will happen if we give lots of iPads out <laughs> in South Africa. <laughs> monitoring, we have the, most of the Berg is systematically going under the clustering monitoring program, which um, Kakadu management was quite interested in. But we have no rates of deterioration monitoring, both of it. We do not actually have scientific recording of, of, of physical deterioration and very little specialist advice because the specialists aren't necessarily out there. Monitoring as I've, you've seen at the pic, the iPad monitoring, and they monitoring as and when. Because they, they, when their rangers go in there, they go in there and that's it. 
Physical mitigation, um, little coordinated specialist advice because we don't have the funds to access specialists. Uh, we have limited amount of site works, but we do do graffiti, graffiti removal and we have removable drip lines when and it's required. And then we are starting with the things like the 3D scanning and the infrared photography that can assist later. Lovely thing, uh, as a South African uh, used to the Berg and other rock art, these randomly drawn lines up to six meter long of of bathroom silicon put up by rangers when they think it, there's water flowing over it is magnificent and when they peel down and they hang like that and now neatly forms a little waterfall onto the rock art is, is amazing to see but when it comes to tourism the boardwalks and the railings to prevent people and animal and to prevent dust from stirring up pruning and controlled burning regimes are also very good and the removal of wasps and nests. There's some um, of your little critters impacting on rock art. That is a picture of the drip line. Obviously taken like this, but most sites have got five or six of them. It's, it's amazing to see. Because yeah, our, our local communities and the descendant communities will say, the spirits are gonna get upset. Yeah, no. Presentation, limited tourist facilities in the UDP. I am going to be controversial, I'm sorry George, to say that we've not been as successful as we could with our tourism facilities and little exposure. For some other reason, Kakadu has got this under control. Google art projects, digital access, well visited sites aimed at mass tourism with good infrastructure, large number of rock art tours, thousands and thousands, boardwalk rails, good visitor centers and well advertised. So case studies, main caves, probably our most successful rock art um, <coughs> site that we can talk about it. Bit controversial, but I think the figures are looking good and it might be because the infrastructure is good and it's close to a restaurant and good parking, etc., etc. So it works, it can probably work better, but it does. Just a few pictures, wooden boardwalks, I know we're looking at forever wood, etc. From a conservation point of view, if this goes up in flame, there goes your best example of a rock art tourism site. The famous paintings from there. And a little bit of interpretation on the archaeology, etc. And as you can see, the kiddies love it. Case study comeback. I'm not going to go too much into detail in it. Yes, Cole, there you are. Um, I think the the... the Community custodian program doesn't work. They seem to find other work, uh, do not arrive. Uh, Melanie does have a bit of a point when she, she talks about that it's, not, it's nobody's really remit to do this. I've put the picture of Carl and his scanner here because perhaps digital displays and, and linking it to a digital world we might tap into some of the visitors that Kakadu gets. But I think you want to see Kakadu. Iber is what their most famous site. I was watching um, Greatest Bike Rides and he finally f ended up in the north of Australia and I could see my Iber rock art site yet. Um, they have community ranges that comes in seasonally because I think if you look at the amount of staff at Kakadu National Park for conservation, it generally looks small. In, in, in comparison with the amount of people we have in our protected areas. It's because they've got the region, uh, ra uh, the seasonal people who come in who are trained in biodiversity and cultural management. <laughs> One big difference is, for instance, here they give talk twice a day during peak tourism season. They don't charge. It's the community rangers do that for free as part of looking after the rock art size and after, uh, as part of which they feel are their responsibility to look at it. What's interesting of this site is that we actually have a painting of a Tasmanian tiger which became extinct on mainland Australia uh, for to 34,000 years old. We've got a painting of in the 1880s of a white fella. Um, in June to September the talks are given by the rangers. It's a one kilometre circular walk. The main loop is wheelchair accessible and it attracts thousands of visitors. This is the one I think I've shown, I'm nearly done. Uh, to most of you, a little 
easily attachable, remembering but to indicate to the people what has um, there. This is the ranger. Mm. Where is mine? <laughs> um, giving his talk for free. Very good signage. What is lovely is the ranger notes. They leave little messages themselves. This is the type of intervention that you can see. It looks. It's. It's not taking away from the sense of place or anything. They have steel boardwalks specifically to make sure fire doesn't happen. And look at that magnitude of people coming to look at a rock art site. That's only one quarter of this big site that I could take. I've not seen it in South Africa. Um, the figure count, because they now have various rock art sites in this one kilometer loop, so they're not all necessarily at the same place. The figure count for the four o'clock to six o'clock that day was over 350 people came into the rock art site. We've, it's, for us as South Africans, it's unimaginable to to, to, to think of that. I'm going to quickly go through the visitor centre. Um, I think a problem that we have in the, uh, in the MDP is that we have visitor centre fo solely focusing on rock art. These are integrated visitor centre. Displays were done, not just with traditional owners, but um, very importantly, designed with park staff. Each section within the park had a chance to look at the display relevant to them. So when it came to the fish, the fishy people did it. When it came to other aspects, it has um, won se several awards and it clearly shows the two views of, of the park, non-Aboriginal and Aboriginal. few pictures to see what the quality of it is like. Drip line doing, um, I mean personally I wouldn't put that picture up there. And this is my favourite. Somebody clearly ruined the Land Rover, the backside of it, and now it's inside a visitor centre, and you can go and climb in the visitor in the Land Rover. And the walkie-talkie has got real recordings of rangers doing firefighting or anti-poaching, and it's lovely. And I mean, how much did it cost? Take your already buggered up Land Rover, stick it in there, and, and the kids love it. It's absolutely lovely. Points to remember. It's part of a cultural landscape, not just an archaeological record. Well-meaning but untested, inappropriate intervention can have dr drastic consequences, including the prevention of future dating methodologies and accelerated deterioration. Inaccurate diagnosis of deterioration factors is common. The management of rock outside is unrealistic in the assessment and expectation of the tourism potential. Here I am, we, 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 we seem to be frantically wanting to make money and get tours to our site and we are, uh, uh, perhaps we can learn from Emma Cosini on that, that we need to, to get back to basics. The key messages here. It is suggested that in 15 years time half of Australia's rock art sites will be gone. They are behind many countries when it comes to the physical management and the monitoring and recording of sites although it's the oldest tangible history in the world. Uh, moving ahead, we must, in both countries, develop and implement simple, elegant monitoring systems, advance active local stewardship, invest in key sites, encourage reviews of sites open to the public. That's something that we don't do. We don't have post-mortems about our, our projects and things. Train graduates in, uh, in heritage and land management Create interpretation focusing on values and use tourism expertise. Conclusion. The rock art conservation in both countries suffer because of ad hoc approaches, little funding, limited rock art conservation training programs, a failure to review and monitor past conservation efforts or existing rock art tourism sites, and a lack of cultural context alongside increasing development pressures, increasing weather, uh, increasing number of weathering events and government in action. <coughs>